Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you decided to join us. I hope you're enjoying these lessons as much as we are. We're studying the lessons for the second set of lessons for the year of 2013, uh, for the months of April, May, and June. These series of lessons are entitled Major Lessons from Minor Prophets. And this is lesson nine in that series, and it covers the two small prophets, Zephaniah and Nahum. We think it would be most useful if you would grab your Bible and follow along with us, but before you do that, let's have a word of prayer together. Our kind and loving Father, we believe that every part of Scripture has its place, its use, that it's intended for our benefit, for our instruction. Here are two small books in the Minor Prophets. What do they have to say to us? And most importantly of all, what do they tell us about you? May that be our discovery. Today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Zephaniah, like many of his fellow prophets and Nahum, pronounced doom against Israel's neighbors. But Zephaniah also spoke out very bluntly against the corruption in Jerusalem. Some words, the moral state of the southern kingdom deteriorated rapidly after the reign of King Hezekiah. That was from 729 to 686 BC. The religious reforms he instituted were soon eradicated by the evil influence of Manasseh. Remember, he, were, he, he ruled for 55 years, his, uh, uh, Hezekiah's son. And Amon, his son, who ruled for only two years, into this scene of moral and religious degeneration, degeneracy came the boy king, Josiah. Upon the discovery, that after he'd been king for about, what, 10, 12 years, actually it may be a little longer than that, uh, they discovered in the temple, he said, we need, we need to clean up this temple. It's kind of messy. We need to clean it up, see what we can do. And while they were cleaning up the, the temple in Jerusalem there, this is Solomon's temple we're talking about, um, they discovered a copy, what was probably, reading sort of between the lines, probably the book of Deuteronomy. Now, it may have been all the books of Moses, but at least probably the book of Deuteronomy. And when the scholars read it, they decided that they needed to go and read it to the king, this young gentleman. What, do you think that that had been miraculously preserved? Because Manasseh for 55 years and those wicked kings before, had they not tried to destroy every copy of anything they could find? Uh, yeah, that's a hard question to answer. Manasseh certainly didn't care for anything about the, about the, you know, the temple or doing anything in terms of worshiping Jehovah. That's I just imagine, sure. I can yeah. imagine some little prophet kind of hiding this thing out yeah. in the corner trying to keep it away from a wicked king. <laughs> well, his regime, uh, he, he, he launched a series of reforms, a fantastic series of reforms. In fact, his reforms were so extensive, they actually extended somewhat up into the territory of the northern kingdom, which at that time was occupied by Samaritans. You remember that, that uh, the northern kingdom had been overrun years before that. But he went up there and was doing some reforms up there as well. Well, this reform apparently was backed by Zephaniah and Jeremiah, who were contemporaries. But the prophet's call for repentance ultimately seemed to fall on deaf ears. Wickedness remained unabated, and Judah was ripe for judgment. Zephaniah is a book of contrast, for no other prophet paints a darker picture of God's judgment, and no other prophet paints a brighter picture of Israel's future glory. Historically, the book of Zephaniah was used in the province of God to prepare Judah for the reforms of revival under King Josiah. Through the prophecy, the nation of the, the prophet's day was faced with its sin, reminded of coming judgment, and instructed concerning the ultimate glory that will come to Israel. Zephaniah goes farther than any other of the minor prophets in emphasizing the future conversion of the Gentiles. That includes, I think, all of us here, so we're thankful for that. To the worship of the true God. Two recurring expressions are important in the book of Zephaniah. Remnant, which occurs several times, and Day of the Lord, which occurs frequently, many times. Where did Zephaniah come from? Zephaniah. He came from the southern kingdom. He was a great, great 
great, I think, grandson of King Hezekiah. So he was related to the king. Uh, um, so, yeah. So the purpose of Zephaniah's prophecy is to set forth what the day of the Lord will mean to ungodly Judah, to the world powers harassing them, and to the godly remnant. His theme is the day of the Lord, which destroys the false remnant of Baal, destroys the God-rejecting nations, and purifies the true remnant. So it's not all gloom and doom. What does it do for the remnant? Purifies them. Purifies them. During the reign of Josiah, the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, specifying plainly the results of continued apostasy and calling atten the attention of the true church to the glorious prospects beyond. These are words from Ellen White. His prophecies of impending judgment upon Judah apply with equal force to the judgments that are to fall upon an impending world at the time of the second advent of Christ. That's Prophets and Kings. Page 389. In, 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 could that be said that that was a type and there is an anti-type that's going to that's gonna take place that, that's going to look similar, only it'll be bigger? Yes. Yeah. So this sort of parallels Revelation? In some ways, yes. In some ways. Zephaniah 3.8, just a little trivia here. Zephaniah 3.8 has the unique characteristic of containing all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Not only that, there are some letters which are, take a different form when they're at the end of a word than they do in the middle of a word, and it has all those end of the word forms as well. No other verse in the scriptures repeats this characteristic. So Zephaniah 3, if you want a, a quiz question sometime for a Bible quiz, there's a good one. Good. Aside from the numerology, is it a is it a great verse? What does it say? Uh, it's a historical oh, verse. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose we can read it. You want to see what it says? Yeah, Zephaniah three. And I'll read from my Good News Bible. <clears throat> Just wait. Hold on. All of a sudden, it decided to go somewhere else for me. Just wait. The Lord says, "Wait for the day when I rise to accuse the nations. I have made up my mind to gather nations and kingdoms in order to let them feel the force of my anger." The whole earth will be destroyed by the fire of my fury. Mm. How's that? When is that describing? Well, I suppose I should ask you that question. In the fire of my jealous wrath, all the earth shall be consumed. Yep. That's, that's the last part of the verse. Sometime yeah. in the future. Is that the third coming? Or the second coming? Probably the third coming, yeah. Well, there's another interesting thing about Zephaniah, the following verse, which I guess we probably should read as well. Then I will change the people of the nations, and they will pray to me alone and not to other gods. They will all obey me. Now, if you read in one of the more traditional translations, it will say um, something a little different. Let me see if I can get this for you. Zephaniah 3. Nine. What version are we going to? Well, I'm going to go to the um, New American Standard. For then I will give to the people the purified lips, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. Now, in the King James, I guess I, maybe I should have gone there, because I'm sure that's the, 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 the version that the, the comment was, was talking on. It literally says, For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. And some people have regarded that as a prophecy because, guess what? What? The dead uh, no other nation in history has ever, uh, uh, I'm sorry, gives a clear prophecy that God will restore the Hebrew language to the nation of Israel. No other nation in history has ever risen back up after centuries of being dispersed. In 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn. Not only that, no other language on earth has ever been restored after centuries of being quiet. Basically, the, the Hebrew language died out, died out just about the time of Jesus. Virtually no one, except the scholars wrote it, but they didn't speak it. Probably about the time of the Jamnia or something yeah. after the... Uh, about 100, yeah. around about 90 or 100 A.D. The Hebrew language was restored along with the nation of Israel. The restoration of this ancient language is mainly credited to 
Eleazar ben Yehuda, who lived from 1858 to 1922. After he moved to Israel in 1881, he created thousands of words to fit the modern Hebrew culture, became becoming the first author of a modern Hebrew dictionary, which promoted the rebirth of the Hebrew language in this restored nation. And did if you he, stop and think, did he yeah. take the old words, yeah. and then he thought of new words for the new modern inventions like iPod or something yeah. like that, exactly, so that they could speak Hebrew again. Yeah. Well, how about well, that? and not only that, if stop and think about what happened after World War II. What happened in Israel after World War II? People from all over the world flocked to Israel. And what language did they speak? Multiple languages. The, a lot of different languages. The only language they knew somewhat in all of them, more or less some at least, was Hebrew. So it was appropriate for them to, to promote the Hebrew language. And now the newspapers in, in Jerusalem, tomorrow's newspaper will have a language which could have been written, could have been read by Isaiah or Daniel or... There are two ladies in my gym who speak Hebrew. It's a lovely language to listen to. Yeah, yeah. Well, one more comment about Zephaniah. We humans keep looking for a religion that will give us access to God without having to bother with people. We want to go to God for comfort and inspiration when we're fed up with men and women and children around us. We want God to give us an edge in the dog-eat-dog -dog competition of daily life. That's when the prophets step in and interrupt us, insisting everything you do or think or feel has to do with God. Every person you meet has to do with God. We live in a vast world of interconnectedness, and the connections have consequences, either in this things or in people, and all the consequences come together in God. The biblical phrase for the coming judgment, the, I'm sorry, the coming together of the consequences is judgment day, or what does, Zep, what does Zephaniah call it? Day the, the day of the Lord. Lord. We can't re, be reminded too often or too forcefully of this reckoning. Zephaniah's voice in the choir of prophets sustains the intensity, the urgency. So, and then one more word from Ellen White that would fit with this message of Zephaniah, nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible, than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior. By prayer, by the study of his word, by faith in his abiding presence, the weakest of human beings may live in contact with the living Christ, and he will hold them by hand that will never let them go. That's Ministry of Healing, page 182. That's powerful. What do you think it means when it talks about taking hold of um, or relying wholly, I'm sorry, relying wholly on the merits of the Savior? Now, some of you are aware, I'm sure, that uh, some of our Christian friends have a very different idea about merits. Um, our Roman Catholic friends believe that sa the saints are people who live such good lives that they not only earn their own salvation, they, that's, that's not a fair term, but they not only deserve salvation themselves, but they have excess merits that can be shared by others. So if you pray to them and they have excess merits, they can share those merits with you so you can be saved. Do you think that's what it's talking about here? No. So. You don't think so? <laughs> what does it mean? What do merits, what's the term merits? Is that what we're asking? Yes, that's what we're asking. I would think some would think uh, the merit of Christ dying on the cross. Would okay. Be. Why is that a merit? Uh, it's almost got a connotation with substitution, but not quite. There's a link mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Merits in the Catholic sense are really something that you acquire by labor. Mm -hmm. It's something that you can Earn. go about and you can do, and therefore you have earned this merit. And you might even have some to share. Well, they, if you're a saint, that's right. And they can be transferred. If but, you have a, keep, uh, a balance system, so you got certain one, then you keep living more on, the, on this scale, balance scale, and you stack up this thing, and it's over overpowers this the other side. And that, uh, that's not even, even Jewish have some of that uh, concept. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a lot of music people that study the 
the classics and they study what these composers have done put together mm -hmm. so in a way what they have produced is kind of a merit that they're looking at it's kind of a study thing that you mm -hmm. you look into to see um, how they did it what happened when they done it mm -hmm. and all kinds of things like that well could we apply that principle to Christ oh yeah and what would we learn well, you'd have to study his word, first of all, mm -hmm. find out what he did mm -hmm. and what That's turned out. I thinking the merits of his sacrificing himself mm -hmm. would be a merit that would, we would look at. But to me, it would be studying the whole of his life and the yeah. biblical record. Something that can accomplish something, I guess, yes. could be called a merit. What he did, we can't work for and get as opposed to the Catholic idea, it is worthy, it is a good thing, it is something that we want, but it comes as a gift, not as something that we, we get can... We demerits. You have to... Yeah. We've got a <laughs> stack of them. You have to accept it. You get a merit that you did not really earn in one sense. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> well, and Great Controversy, page 555, says, you know, that we become, well, basically by beholding we become changed. And I think really that's what Ellen White is talking about. She's saying, look at the life of Jesus Christ and try to imitate his life. Try to imitate what he did. Try to imitate his practices. And if we do that, if we, if we, if we really try to imitate his practices, then what happens? Some of that rubs off on us. Well, Romans 5.10, Paul says, we are saved by his life. Mm -hmm. We are healed by his life. In other words, by hold, beholding you become changed. So it's, it's not foreign to, to the... Uh... To their credit, uh, ca Catholics also use that sort of idea to talk about ca Christ's sacrifice and his service and his heart of a servant, yeah. and they try to mimic that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's look at some verses in, in uh, Zephaniah. Look at Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. You f and and this, is, this is Zephaniah speaking to the surrounding nations. You Philistines are doomed, you people who live along the coast. The Lord has passed sentence on you. He will destroy you, and not one of you will be left. Your land by the sea will become open fields with shepherds' huts and sheep pens. The people of Judah who survive will occupy your land. They will pasture their flocks there and sheep in the ha sleep in the houses of Ashkelon. The Lord their God will be with them and make them prosper again. The Lord Almighty says, I have heard the people of Moab and Ammon insulting and taunting my people and boasting that they would seize their land. As surely as I am the living Lord, the God of Israel, I swear that Moab and Ammon are going to be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. They will become a place of salt pits and everlasting ruin overgrown with weeds. Those of my people who survive will plunder them and take their land. Has that happened yet? Yes, it certainly has. Yeah, it went, there was, it went through stages when it was absolutely like that. And the interesting thing is there are some... Pro yes. Which time? Well... When are you referring to? Well, when these nations were first destroyed and so forth, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So s no. soon after, the, after, the, uh, after Israel yeah. came back from Babylon? Yeah. Even before that, they were overrun by the Babylonians and so forth, and just like Israel was. Now, if did, did Israel it, occupy those lands at that time? Um, I'm not sure I, the answer to that question. Or is this a prophecy for the future? No, I don't think it's a prophecy. But the point of quoting this is that God makes a number of prophecies like this, a number of prophecies like this through the prophets of the Old Testament and not one of them has failed. Does that tell us something about him? Well, when there's a, a prophet from Israel or a Jewish prophet telling the other nations this is going to happen to them, do they care? I mean, I mean, they here's this. They probably laughed back at the time. Yeah. And, and so today, when the people in the church tell the world, hey, be careful, there's doom, you know, your doom's coming. I mean, do they care? So, I mean, even though people don't care, God still wants the warning to go out. 
How do you suppose the Jews feel today and Israel of today with their problems with the Gaza Strip and uh, the Palestinians, etc.? How do you think they feel about this verse? They're looking forward to that day. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, a lot of the Christian churches, I think, use some of these texts yeah. to say Jerusalem and Israel is going yeah. to expand and uh, that's when God is Gonna, God is going to establish his kingdom here on earth. Look at another verse. Zephaniah 1, verse 12. Back up a few verses. At that time I will take a lamp and search Jerusalem. Do you remember any other ancient stories about people taking lamps and searchings? Doing searches? That was a famous Greek guy, wasn't it? <laughs> At that time I will take a lamp and search Jerusalem. I will punish the people who are self-satisfied and confident who say to themselves, the Lord never does anything one way or the other. How could a nation like Israel, knowing their past history, say God never does anything one way or the other? Is that another that? way of saying God is powerless? Well, either powerless or he doesn't care. In other words, if God doesn't do something every day, a miracle every day, um, and a few years go by, they say um, God no longer cares. I mean, how long it had been since yeah. God had moved? Well, and, and they were, I mean, the northern kingdom had been wiped out and, and things were looking very bad. I mean, you know, the, the Assyrians had come down with 185,000 trained military to wipe them out. And what happened in the days of Hezekiah? Yeah. You know, he'd, he had, they had prayed and and an angel of God wiped them out. Otherwise, they would have wiped out Jerusalem back then. So they forgot about all that? Apparently. We suggested earlier that Zephaniah was a, a contemporary of Jeremiah's and they worked together. Look at Jeremiah's comments. Jeremiah 5, verse 12. The Lord's people have denied him and have said, He won't really do anything. We haven't had hard times. We won't have war or famine. Sounds a lot like Zephaniah, doesn't it? It's all kind of like Second Peter too, isn't it? Yeah. yeah and even people. even today, you hear people say, "Well, look, what she said was a hundred some odd years ago. Mm -hmm. Things must have changed, and yeah. off we go to a different to a different mindset." You mentioned Second Peter, Second Peter three verses three and four. First of all, you must understand that in these last days, now Peter is calling you know, his time, the last days, some people appear whose lives are controlled by their own lust. They will mock you and will ask, he promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. God, God can't step in and do anything. No. Well, some people are so simple in their thinking. Well, let's say, there's no God. Well, how do you know? Well, look, I tell God to strike me dead. We're still here. I mean, that, that, yeah. how do you communicate uh, pe with people <laughs> at that level? Well, what do you think? Was that, was that wishful thinking on the part of the people who were saying such things? Yes, I was thinking that, yeah. Were they, they worried about God actually stepping in and doing something they wouldn't have been very, they, wouldn't, they ultimately were not very happy about? Of course, um, not all the people were probably thinking this way because it starts out God taking a lamp and looking. It's yeah. like searching through and picking out the ones that think this way. Yeah. So it's not exactly. Was he picking you know, out the ones who thought this way, or are they thinking about the one picking out the ones who didn't think that way? Well, you you got to do both yeah. to separate them. Mm -hmm. so. Well, those who are disobeying God and are not ready to do anything about it are always ready to hope that God will not disturb them. This is often the attitude, forgive the comment, but of teenagers. They want to live their life, they want to do their thing. Don't disturb me with thinking about anything serious. But the children of Israel certainly had plenty of evidence that God had the power to do anything he wanted to. It is always difficult to admit that some evil that befalls one might be one's own fault. Imagine that. On the other hand, it did seem that other nations were winning all the battles. On that basis, do you remember what was the thinking of the nations back in that day? 
gods that win are the real gods. The real gods are the, I mean, the, the, the real gods are the ones who are the gods of the nations who, who win the battles. So, I mean, a nation that came out of slavery and now is being overrun by its enemies, I mean, what kind of a god do they worship? Right? But all through history, God has a habit <laughs> of waiting till the last, very last thing when it, ought, when it becomes apparent that the people can't do anything on their own, they're done, then he can step in and do something mm -hmm. and he gets the credit for it instead yeah. of them. And for obvious reasons, he, he, he's the one who needs the credit. I mean, not, not that he needs it, but I mean, he's the one to whom the credit should be given, I exactly. guess. Exactly. It's, the way I should it's say. hard to wait that long for God to act. You want to do something. Yeah. But even in our own lives, it happens that way. Yeah. One of the, the main themes of, of Zephaniah is the day of the Lord. Um, what do you suppose he had in mind when he talked about the day of the Lord? When that judgment would be passed. The day that the Lord would move? Well, let's pick a couple of verses. Look at Zephaniah 1.7. The day is near when the Lord will sit in judgment, so be silent in his presence. Uh, on that day of slaughter, says the Lord, I will punish the officials, the king's sons, and all who practice foreign customs. On that day, verse 10, says the Lord, I, you will hear the sound of crying at the fish gate in Jerusalem. You will hear wailing in the newer part of the city and a great crashing sound in the hills. I mean, that sounds like it's pretty, pretty serious, doesn't it? Wait, wail and cry when you hear this, you that live in the lower part of the city, because all the merchants will be dead. That's a pretty, pretty serious thing. Verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near, very near and coming fast. That will be a bitter day, for even the bravest soldiers will cry out in despair. And remember in Amos it said, you know, you run from a lion and you run into a bear, or you go home and you lean against the wall and a snake bites you. You know, this is... The day of the Lord is not going to be good news for everybody. What is God trying to do here? He's raising his voice and saying, pay attention to me. Yeah. It's the text thus far, and no further shalt thou go. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's, Zephaniah is preaching within, let's say, 15 years, plus or minus, of Babylonian captivity. You think... It that was a lot like the third angel's message, doesn't it? Oh dear. <laughs> you would have to mention that. <laughs> verse 15. Like, oh. Yeah. Go ahead and read verse 15 there. In your chapter 1? Yeah, chapter 1. A day of wrath is, a, oh, yeah. is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of, of trumpet blast and battle cry. Mm. Wow. Soldiers attacking fortified cities and high towers, yeah. So God can see the future coming, and he knows in a few short years they are going to be an absolute, desperate, captive situation. But they think all is well, and God can see past that year number 16 or something when... Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, you know, the, there's some days where it's easy to forget about the Lord. And there's some days that it's not easy at all. <laughs> and I think the day of the Lord is a time where it's on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing well, else can come I mean, in. look what's happening in our world. It's interesting that, you know, it used to be that we'd almost never hear anything about any mention of God or whatever. And then disasters come along. And as soon as there's a disaster, which is, oh, pray, pray, pray to God for healing or restoration or whatever it happens, whatever needs to happen. And those kind of things are happening more and more. Um, and it's good. I have a feeling we're, we're, we're heading for the day when people are going to say, everything else has failed. God has to take over. He's got to do something. Okay, but how do we put this in comparison to Jonah? Jonah went to Nineveh and said these same things, and mm -hmm. they made a change. Yes. But this time, it's different. Yeah. Yeah. You know... It's kind of similar, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When you try to take a message to people that already really know it and have been just letting it go, very difficult to stir that. When you take it to a new 
somebody who's not known, a Ninevite, let's say. Yeah, in Jonah's time. In Jonah's time, or a similar person today. They see that message and their eyes get big and all of a sudden they want to know more and, and they respond to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so often we just are plowing the same ground over mm -hmm. and over and over. Mm -hmm. Zephaniah is one of the few books in the Bible where it is suggested, suggested, notice that word, that God's fury or anger seems to lead to his directly destroying people. You think that's real? We just read some of the verses. L look at a couple more. On the day when the Lord shows his fury, not even all their silver and gold will save them. The whole earth will be destroyed by the fire of his anger. He will put an end, a sudden end, to everyone who lives on earth. Isn't that pretty blunt? Shameless nation, come to your senses before you are driven away like chaff blown by the wind, before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day when he shows his fury. Turn to the Lord, all you humble people of the land who obey his commands. Do what is right and humble yourselves before the Lord. Perhaps you will escape punishment on the day when the Lord shows his anger. Well, you know, in, in the Garden of Eden, God said to Adam and Eve, sin kills. Mm -hmm. Could this be the same thing that mends your ways? Because if you continue, this sin is going to kill you. And if God shows himself to sin, it will be like a burning fire. Mm -hmm. So is God saying sin is going to kill? So... And so we're, we're back to the question we've already asked two or three times. Let's ask it again. When were or are these prophecies to be fulfilled? Well, well the, the immediate fulfillment came with the Babylonian conquest, didn't that's it? That's right. Three times. Um, but if, you read earlier that, that it was for the end time people. Yeah. So it hasn't been fulfilled for that group yet, but it's coming. And what will it do? I mean, what would happen if, if the pastor who we recognized as a man of God who had maybe was a prophet like Zephaniah got up and started preaching this to us? Would we, would we say, you know, he's um, gone there off would, the rocket? There, there would be a group who said, yes, brother, preach on. There would be another group who said, get out of here. We don't want to hear what you've got to say. Yeah. That's not us. No. <laughs> but Norm, which would be the majority? Oh boy, be careful. I suspect <laughs> that the majority fine. would be get out of here, don't bother me. Yeah. Is it we have a new we have a new theology. That stuff you're talking about is history. The thing that strikes me about both is and it it you can't help but see it when the end comes, it's gonna be quick. Yeah. We all get complacent. Mm -hmm. You get used to things. Well, things are getting a bit bad. You alluded to this a while ago. But just recently, some of the stuff, I've even heard radio announcers say, something's going on here. This has mm -hmm. never been. Yeah. You don't hear that from the media very often. Yeah. But it says right here, it's going to be quick. Thief in the night, it has it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I have a, or had, he's passed now, um, a friend who careful study of the book of Revelation came to the conclusion that the seven last plagues would last a total of two weeks. Could be right. There's reason. He had, his, he had his good logic behind it, right out of the scripture. Well, you know, like these people, how many people like to look at themselves and make improvements mm. and say, oh, I am doing something wrong, I should change. How many people in the world are like that? Yeah. That's even like New Year's resolutions. <laughs> it's a big joke how they don't, uh, you know, people don't look at themselves and then follow through. Yeah. Who are the ones who do that and make changes? They're the ones who look to Christ, mm -hmm. to look to what he did, his unselfish life, and they want to be like that, and then the Holy Spirit just reveals all kinds of things that he wants changed. <laughs> the part that is puzzling to me a little bit is this. You've heard the expression, 
the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Yes. Yeah. That was historically true. It's true even today. In places where it's very difficult to be an Adventist, yeah. for example, those are the places where the church is growing by leaps and bounds. India, isn't that one example? India's. There are states in India which have forbidden people from, from changing religions. And if you come in there and try to preach to them and tell them you want to become, you know, change their church, oh boy, that's almost a crime against humanity. But the church is just growing. Look what ha is happening in Egypt right yeah. now as we speak. The Coptics yeah. are being killed, their properties burned. And We've never had to face anything like that in our time. Don't we understand that it'll be like that until probation closes? Till everybody is on one side and, or the other. And given the Satan's, Satan's behavior, it's probably going to be a lot worse. It's not going to get better. <clears throat> well, when the Ninevites repented that in the days of Jonah, God waited for 150 years to bring destruction on them. But finally, he had to do something after they showed evidence of returning to their wicked ways. What could God do at such a point? Think of all the prophets God sent through the years, even his own son. And think of the parables that Jesus gave and how they mocked and scoffed and how they treated him. Imagine God's people claiming that his son's picture of God was satanic. Mm. You know, you, you might be hard to believe that, but let me just show you that. Uh, jump over to John 8, now into the New Testament. <clears throat> Look at... Um, Let's start with verse 46. Which of you can prove that I'm guilty of sin? This is Jesus talking to the Jewish religious leaders. Mm -hmm. Which of you can prove that I'm guilty of sin? If I tell the truth, then why do you not believe me? He who comes from God listens to God's words. You, however, are not from God, and that is why you will not listen. They asked Jesus, were we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon in you? I have no demon, Jesus answered. I honor my father, but you dishonor me. I am not seeking honor for myself, but there is one who is seeking it and who judges in my favor. I am telling you the truth. Whoever obeys my teaching will never die. And he goes on and you know, he, finally, he, has, he, he finally has to say some very strong words against them. Because Jesus wasn't what they were looking for. They looked yeah. straight at Jesus and said, you have a demon in you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, much, I mean, they had to explain the miracles too. Yeah. So How and, much? Yeah. And at the end of that conversation, oh. verse yeah. 59, they picked up stones yeah. to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. Yeah. Mm. Because what? Remember, at the end of that conversation, just before the verse you read, 58 says, Jesus had told them already two or three times in that conversation, even the part of the conversation we have recorded, and I'm sure there's a lot more of the conversation that we don't have recorded. He had said, look, I am God. I am God. I am the Messiah. And finally he said, before Abraham was, I am. And there's no way you could misunderstand that language. And that's the time they started grabbing stones. Could they not have searched the scriptures and see that Jesus fulfilled all the prior scriptures? They didn't go back and say, let's disprove this man by the Bible. Here's the problem. They went through the Old Testament and they picked out the verses which we now believe apply to his second coming and his third coming, at a time with verses that talk about how he's going to rule for the world and how he's going to conquer his enemies, etc. And they wanted those prophecies to be fulfilled in their day. That's the problem. Well, there were other prophecies, but they didn't want to read those. Well, those aren't the ones they like to talk about. So what does God do in a case like that? You come to Hosea 4, 17. Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Is this the same message that needs to be given to our generation? Well, I mean, honestly, what would you do with people who, who fulfill, well, the people who are described in 2 Kings 17 or that was talking about the northern kingdom of Israel, or Second Chronicles 36, 15. Let, 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 let's just look at that for a second. Second Chronicles 36, 15, and 16. 
the Lord, now this is talking about the demise of the nation that we're talking about now, the southern nation of Judah. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, had continued to send prophets to warn his people because he wanted to spare them and the temple. Ellen White says, if they hadn't, if they had done what they were supposed to do, to do the temple of Solomon would, would have survived forever. I was quite surprised to read that. Mm -hmm. He wanted to spare them and the temple, but they ridiculed God's messengers, ignoring his words and laughing at his prophets, until at last the Lord's anger against his people was so great that there was no escape. I mean, what do you do at that point? Give them up. <laughs> Give them up. Sad story. Well, what about us? It's always appropriate to talk about us, right? Aren't Seventh-day Adventists really Christians who have also accepted the third angel's message? Norm, you were mentioning the third angel's message. Dude. Can we give this message in such a way as to be useful and meaningful to the world today? Only if we believe it ourselves. Well, how many people in our world are worried about what it says in the third angel's message? If you go down the street down here and say, uh, are you worried about what it says in the third angel's message? They'll say, huh? <laughs> Why do that? They think God is not doing anything today. Not it's at like all. like Zechariah's day. Yeah. yeah. So I ask this question. If Zechariah is standing on one corner preaching his message, if he were today standing on the corner preaching his message, and you were standing on the opposite corner preaching the third angel's message, would people be able to tell the difference? Probably not. So Zephaniah was the third angel's message of his day? Now, what is the third angel's message? Well, we should, we should read that. That's a fair, fair question. Um, we can't expect everyone to know that. Turn to Revelation 14 and look at, starting with verse 9. Just to remind us what we're supposed to be saying. Yeah. Revelation 1. <laughs> what we're supposed to be saying, Revelation 14. <laughs> Hang on. And go down to verse 9. A third angel follows the first two, or followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast in its image and receives the mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast in its image, for anyone has the mark of its name. Preach it, Zephaniah. Yeah, <laughs> just about, isn't it? So do not serve a false god. So what is it that God ultimately wants? Well, obviously, when, when you get to that point, the third angel's message, there's no way out. Mm -hmm. No way out. So there's no there's no. Well, back up a little there's before no that. What do you mean? Oh, you mean when that is actually happening. Right. Yeah, okay. Right. But it is given long before it's actually happening. So there is a way out during the time of the message. That's but you're right. right, when it happens, it's, it's history. But God? there's the door that you go through, and at that point, there's no way out. So yeah. Yeah. maybe the only way out is death. God yeah. wants respect. He okay. wants to be recognized as God, and to be loved as God, and to be able to love us. Well, think about what we have in the Old Testament. We have God stepping into human history at times when there's a drastic problem and he, and he does incredible things, floods the world, kills the firstborn in Egypt, mows down 185,000 Assyrians. When things get desperate, God steps in and he does, and, and, and comes down on Mount Sinai and just, you know, blackens the mountain and, and scares everybody to death. And what, what is he accomplished by doing that? Opening up our ears. Yeah, okay. Gets our attention. He gets people's attention. And how long does it last? Depends on who you are. Yes. 
It depends on it depends on your response. Yeah. At Sinai, it lasted less than forty days. Yeah. Yep. But so, and, and, and but Moses listened to it, and it, and he 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 didn't. Individual piece people listened, but yes. the, but the the apparent masses. Worship the golden calf, including That's Aaron. Exactly. That's exactly and, right. And look what happened after the flood. I mean, that was a few generations, but I mean, maybe not even generations. They're building the Tower of Babel. I mean, and, and this happened again and again and again. God steps in and he does something drastic. And Boy, it just makes you think if you're in harmony with the majority, you're in deep trouble. Yeah, <laughs> wow. Well, what God seems to want is this. Why can't he sit down with us? Treat us as friends, speak quietly and respectfully, and have us, you know, listen to what he has to say. You know, there is a warning there that, that he's given. He's not using this as an ultimatum to love me, because how in the world is anybody going to love somebody by threatening them? Yeah. So. But if Zephaniah had gone in quietly and said, you need to behave yourselves. Yeah. Would they have listened? No. Well, it still doesn't diminish the fact that it's real, that the mm -hmm. end is going to come, and if you're in that, that position, that's the point. Yes. Zephaniah was probably the last prophetic book written before Jerusalem was attacked the first time. What verse is it that says, God says, let us reason together? Isaiah 118. Isaiah 118. But you need to, that needs to be in the King James Version. Unfortunately, the, the Hebrew in that passage is, is difficult to interpret. So some other versions may sound quite different. God wants us to think and to com yeah. communicate with him by thinking. And make a choice. Mm -hmm. make so a choice. when it's difficult, you've got all kinds of flexibility to put it your way. <laughs> well, that's what people tend to do. They, they interpret it, you know, when you're not quite sure what it says, then you interpret it the way you think it's supposed to be. Yeah. Or the way you would like it. Sometimes. Yeah. Well, God originally called Abram, Abram at that point, out of Mesopotamia and promised him that he and his descendants would be a blessing to all nations. In the light of the messages of these minor prophets, and 2 Corinthians 33, 9. Let's just look at that for a second. 2 Chronicles. I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles. Manasseh led the people of Judah to commit even greater sins than those committed by the nations whom the Lord had driven out of the land as his people advanced. Even greater sins the Canaanite, than the Canaanites. You know, in all this corruption, God picked out a person here, a Noah here, mm -hmm. a, a prophet here, uh, and you, and so God knew that these people would come through for him. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering in today's world, what can God pick out in us? Is there anything mm -hmm. in us that God can pick out to be one of his? Mm -hmm. does, does God seem to be making any progress? Uh, at, at, in the days of Zephaniah, does it look like things are moving forward just great? Are they just letting him yell and not doing a thing? Well, it seems like it. You know, it's interesting when you read, you know, Gideon going in to take over the land. There's almost a suggestion there that the people were going nuts. I mean, they were, it was like the Satan's spirit was going over them. And, um, and they were fighting Israel. They, they saw Israel w get, wiping out everybody, but yet they kept fighting them. There was only a few people that sued for peace with Israel. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if right here was with Zephaniah that, that Israel was actually taking on that kind of spirit again. Mm -hmm. So something to think about. God intended for the children of Israel to be located there in the center of civilization of their day. And they were supposed to be a blessing and an educating force for all the nations around. And God is very happy with progress? No. Loma Linda is in the middle of a bunch of freeway interchanges. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Let's well, not go pointing fingers. <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying that if God likes his people in the middle of crossroads, we're here too. Well, God soon had to allow his children, his, the second nation, is the, the nation of Israel is gone, now it's the nation of Judah, to be carried off into Babylonian captivity, and only a very small percentage of them ever came back. And even those who did return, if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you discover they're back to doing the same sins that their ancestors did that caused, necessitated the need for the Babylonian captivity. But then under Ezra and Nehemiah, they apparently experienced a great reformation and revival. They never went back to idols of gold and silver or to the fertility cult religions of those around them. But despite becoming exemplary blueprinting Adventists, they were waiting for the Messiah, right? They crucified Jesus Christ when he came to them. Was that what God intended? Did he have to wait so many years for a group who would kill his son? What was he waiting for in the days of Zephaniah? And of course, you know what I'm going to ask next. What's he waiting for in our day? Well, <clears throat> about the same time, there was another prophet by the name of Nahum. Nahum delivered the prophecy. Assyria and its capital Nineveh appeared in, when Nahum uh, delivered his prophecy. And Assyria seemed invincible. A world free of Assyrian domination was unimaginable. Nahum's task was to make it imaginable, to free God's people from Assyrian paralysis, free them to believe in and pray to a sovereign God. Nahum's preaching, his spirit-born metaphors, his God-shaped syntax knocked Assyria off her high horse and cleared the field of Nineveh distraction so that Israel could see that despite her world reputation, Assyria didn't amount to much. Israel could now attend to what was really going on because Nahum has a single message, doomed to Nineveh. It is easy to misunderstand the prophet as simply a Nineveh hater. But Nahum writes and preaches out of the large context in which Israel's sins are denounced as vigorously as are those of her enemies. The effect of Nahum is not to foment religious hate against the enemy, but to say, don't admire or be intimidated by this enemy. They are going to be judged by the very same standards applied to us. Was the feeling in Israel complete fright and yeah. hopelessness that this enemy was, had it taken over on them yet, or that they were just afraid the, the Assyrians are the only nation of their day who had a huge professional army. And when they approached, nobody else could even come close to stand. I mean, you got a farmer that says, oh, give me a gun or give me a, they, no guns in those, give me a sword. How is he going to hold up against a professional army with all their, you know, equipment and all that kind of stuff? Did they forget about the days when they went around the walls of Jericho yeah. with uh, nothing but horns and, and the walls came tumbling yeah. down? Yeah. Well, considering all that had been said in the scriptures about God's wrath and what he does when he gets furious, it is likely that in most cases, God just allows people to reap the natural consequences of their own behavior. Is that a good thing for God to do? What There's time. What hmm? else can he do? Yeah. I mean, you know, um, no eventually, yeah, he just has to step back and say, you know, that's what you've chosen. There's a this. little phrase. It says, God forsaken. Like, are you a God-forsaken person? Are you a God-forsaken country? You know, you don't want to be God-forsaken. Yeah. If the highest priority is human freedom, then God has to allow us to leave him, and he sadly gives us up. When children go astray from their Christian roots to what the parents thought they taught them, is it their fault, or their parents' fault, or both? You know the Proverbs 22, verse 6, verse, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. So therefore, if he departs from it, it must be your fault, right? Well, you can chase blame all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a tangled web to unweave to see whose fault it is. Well, not only that, God knew what was going to happen in his foreknowledge before he did any type, type of creating. He knew what was going to happen and went ahead and created anyway. When parents get to their wit's end in that kind of a situation, what do we call that? When they just say, throw up their hands, there's nothing more I can do. And what do we call it when God does that? 
It's tough love, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, it's let them go. That's mm -hmm. God's wrath in, as defined in Romans and in Hezekiah. Or, um, Hosea. Hosea. No, God's wrath is then nothing more than His letting go and handing over in loving disappointment those who are bent on leaving Him anyway, thus allowing them to reap the experience and, or experience the tragic and awful consequences of their own destructive and rebellious behavior. It's not likely that if Naaman had spoken in kind, gentle words to the people of Nineveh, who were so cruel that they would have despised the Hebrew prophet and the Hebrew God down. I mean, they, they might have said, well, I remember there was this, I mean, not remember, but I, we have the history of Jonah came here and he preached dire message and nothing happened, so why should we pay any attention to you, right? But they forgot that they had changed. Yeah. People who are as cruel as the Syrians need to be spoken to in very strong language, and that's what Zephaniah was, and Nahum were trying, particularly Nahum here, was trying to do. Is it possible that God cared enough about the Assyrians that he hoped that his captive children might bear witness to them? I mean, remember, they were scattered in Assyrian territory. Did any of the Assyrians learn the truth about God from an Israelite slave, perhaps? Find out in heaven. Is it possible that God is just going along through history and he's getting a few Canaanites here and a few Jews there and a few Romans and a few Europeans and a few Americans and finally he says, I guess I have enough now. I'll call it a quits. I don't think that's the way God works. Now we've seen two entire books, Jonah and Nahum, addressed to completely to other nations. And there are many other books that, that have major portions addressed to other nations. Uh, think of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Zephaniah, we've talked about. It's true that the scriptures were given primarily to the Jews, but they were to spread that message to the world. So, how does God get us to take him seriously? How does he get us to sit down and pay attention and, and get us to rise up and then do what we know is right without sending floods, without killing the firstborn, without striking down Uzzah or swallowing up Korodathan and Byram? Is it true that the closer God's children come to the point where he can no longer help them, the louder he raises his voice and the more seriously he speaks? Norm, the third angel's message. That's right. Can you imagine Jesus speaking the words of books like Jonah and Nahum? Or was it the Father or maybe the Holy Spirit? Does God ever talk like that? He did through Nahum and Zephaniah. See you next week.